So thank you very much everyone for joining us for the third protocol town hall. Uh, these have been going on about monthly and we've seen such great responses. So thank you again for joining. Uh, let me just share my screen. So just going over today's agenda, we'll do a few foundation updates. Then Brandon and Arielle will take over protocol updates and we'll leave open some time for a Q&A. So April was a fairly busy month for us. Uh, we've got quite a few initiatives going on. So firstly, on the multi-blockchain front, uh, we created support for Celo, Avalanche, and Moonbeam. Uh, so this brings our total support for 19 chains, uh, most of them EVM-based. So very exciting. Um, if you're building on anything, you know, EVM or Ethereum, uh, the graph likely supports it already. Uh, in terms of migration, we started phase one last week. Uh, you might have seen a large announcement uh, with 10 subgraphs uh, that are being migrated from the hosted service. Uh, so Audius, Dodo, Enzyme, Gnosis, LivePeer, Mstable, Open, Pool Together, Reflexor, and Uma are the first set of migrators. Uh, so we're very excited to be working with these teams. And please reach out to us uh, or take a look at the form that was in our blog post um, and let us know if you wanted support through your migration phase as well. We also posted an indexer migration guide uh, in the Discord and in the forum. So if you're an indexer, uh, you know maybe you're on testnet or on mainnet and are looking to uh, get involved in the migration and start testing Scalar, please take a look at that guide. Uh, but if you're also a new indexer, we have quite a few resources ready for um, anyone who's just ramping up on testnet um, and depending on the kind of environment you're building. So uh, feel free to reach out either to you know, us or uh, message another indexer on the Discord to get started. Third, I wanted to cover educational modules. So uh, Reem, Ecosystem Manager at the Foundation, and myself have been working hard the last few months uh, to develop these courses uh, for academic you know, programs and students that want to learn more about the graph. So we're excited to be initiating uh, two programs with York University in Canada and The Hague in Netherlands. Uh, and lastly, just want to cover grantees. Uh, so Wave 2 is open. Uh, you, you might have seen the application. Uh, feel free to submit at any point, and we'll make sure to reach out to you uh, if the project is aligned. And we wanted to just highlight a few more grantees this time around. So excited to introduce Rachel Black of Good Ghosting, who will just give us an overview of her grant. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me on. Uh, massive fans of everything that the graph is doing. And it's so fantastic just to see like rolling out to different networks. We're about to launch a Matic and we're also exploring Celo and boom, 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 there you are. Um, but what is good ghosting? What are we doing? Uh, we're basically building an application and protocol to incentivize saving. We wanna stop saving being a chore and make it something much more fun. Um, so we're in the process of uh, finalizing our MVP, which will go live on uh, Matic Polygon. Um, basically it's gonna be a savings pool that will run for a fixed amount of time. So it goes for like a month. And then every week in that month, you have to contribute fixed amount, like uh, $50 worth, say. We contribute it onto, a, onto Aave, onto a lending protocol, generates lots of lovely yield. And then we can work out at the end of the pool, like were you a good saver? Did you hit all of your targets? Uh, fantastic. If you didn't, too bad, but you'll still get your uh, deposit and your principal that you've put in. Um, but the principle is going to be split amongst those who were sort of regular savers. So it's it's a really nice way to get higher returns than you would do anyway. We're also going to be adding a rain bit of sponsorship in there. So it will be quite, should be a quite nice juicy return, depending on how everyone else does. Um, you can get like a higher return as well. Um, and yeah, we're just super excited to be building with the graph and, and lots of stuff uh, happening as well. Um, we're also doing community call on Thursday. So if you're curious, jump in on that. It's at 4 p.m. Uh, uh, CET time. I'll uh, post a link to our Discord as well in case anyone's interested. And um, yeah, thank you for having me on. Awesome, thank you, Rachel. And just as more context for everyone, good ghosting, you know, is building subgraphs um, and using them for their DAP, but they're also just revolutionizing the way we think about DeFi um, and they're gamifying it to allow more, you know, younger or less technical users to enter. So the Graph Foundation is here to support, you know, all kinds of Web3 DAPs that are, you know, improving uh, quality of life for our, our society. Uh, next up, uh, Reem and Martin will share a recording from one of our other grantees, Aditya. Yeah, thanks, Eva. Uh, hi, everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Reem. And uh, as she mentioned, uh, I'm the ecosystem manager here at the Graph Foundation. Um, it's been really fun and exciting getting to know all of you, especially through the amazing work that you've done. Uh, one specifically that we wanted to highlight was Aditya's work on uh, the Graph Network uh, Visualization Tool. Uh, this DAP will really help people appreciate what a truly decentralized network will look like. Um, it will not only visualize the graph network, uh, but it will also show data in an easy to understand and interactive way 
but also showcase act network activity and visualize the links between the users and educate new user uh, network participants. Uh, it will use uh, the mainnet subgraph to drive relationships between subgraphs, indexers, curators, and delegators. Now, Aditya would have loved, uh, and he mentioned that he, I believe he might be actually in this call, but he does not have the strongest of internet connections. Uh, so he shared a little video with us to watch. Uh, so just bear with me while I share that. And hopefully just somebody give me a thumbs up that you can see. Amazing. So hi guys, uh, I am King Super from Discord. Uh, I have been an early supporter of Graph Protocol. I have been a testnet curator and also one of the Wave 1 grantees. So today I want to give a demo of what I have built recently. I have created a visualization for Graph Network. So we all know what a centralized service uh, looks like, right? It's a, basically it's a central server controlling all the stuff. Uh, have you guys ever wondered what a decentralized network might look like? And what could be a better example of a decentralized network than our own graph network, right? So let's just jump into it. So all these um, blue nodes are indexers. And uh, all these yellow ones are delegators, as you can see here. And the green ones are the curators, which are actively signaling on the subgraphs. And the oval shaped red ones are the subgraphs. Okay, so what I did is basically combined all the roles, all the four roles, indexers, delegators, curators, subgraph by edges. So basically what's, uh, what is the significance of an edge? So let's say uh, if there is an edge between an indexer and a delegator, that would mean that this delegator is uh, delegating to this indexer. Similarly, if there is an edge between a subgraph and an indexer, Let's say uh, we can zoom into it. So here is our pull together subgraph. So uh, that would mean if, I, if there is an edge between a subgraph and a indexer, so that would mean that that indexer is indexing that subgraph. Similarly, if there is an edge between a curator, this green node is a curator. So that would mean there is an, uh, that curator is actively signaling on that subgraph. So you may be thinking, what is the motivation behind this kind of visualization? So I think this kind of visualization really help us uh, appreciate the beauty of decentralization, right? You cannot, I think uh, Yanif recently tweeted about this, that you cannot just launch a token and say our network is decentralized. It can't be, it can't be done like this, right? This is how our true decentralized network looks like. If you hover over any node, Let's say uh, I go to this indexer. So it will show me all the uh, major information related to that indexer. Basically its role, what is what is the role of that node? It's an indexer, right? Is address, is reward card, query card, indexer stake token, delegated token. Is it over delegated or not? All kind of stuff. Similarly, if you go over any delegator, so it will show some of the information about delegator as well. Similarly true for uh, subgraphs and curators. So in a nutshell, a visualization like this acts as a summary for our graph network, you can, you can say. So it, uh, it helps you identifying the indexer which has the largest number of the delegators. Let's say you can find just by looking at this visualization what all indexer are the most trustworthy because you can judge by the number of delegators that are that have in uh, delegated to that indexer or you can find out what all subgraphs are being actively indexed by the indexers moreover it's a dynamic visualization so what i mean by this is if you hover over any node it will show all the related information and all the other node which are connected to that node it will highlight those edges and you can zoom in to view a uh, specific section of the network or you can zoom out or you can just play with it uh, you can just drag or drop you can just drag a node around in the network uh, i personally like this one i think a visualization like this really help us appreciate the beauty of decentralization and what the graph protocol has achieved today is uh, it's really remarkable so yeah that is it 
and i want to thank uh, graph protocol for giving me a grant for this and i am hoping to add many new features to this project yeah thank you guys bye awesome uh, thanks, Aditya, if you're on this call. Uh, it was really great to see and uh, just a small shameless plug, but tell all your friends Wave 2 applications are open um, and we'd love to see what kind of ideas, innovations and uh, community initiatives all of you have uh, to bring forth to the to the ecosystem. Thanks and I'll pass it back to Eva. Awesome, thank you. And I just shared that link to the visualization if you guys want to check it out and if you have any feedback, feel free to reach out to Aditya. Uh, and so next up, we'll have Brandon and Ariel giving up protocol updates. Thanks, Eva. Yeah, so we'll start with some housekeeping. Uh, as you guys know, uh, we've been hosting the GIP process on Radical. Uh, we heard from a few of you guys a week or two ago that you're having trouble accessing the repo. So for the one of the more recent um, GIPs, I also posted it to HackMD. I actually believe we've fixed that issue. We had to restart the, the seed node um, that we're hosting for the graph specifically. But in the meantime, Radical also released a breaking change, which is 0 0.2, and a lot of you guys have already upgraded to that version. Unfortunately, that's a, a change that needs to be upgraded across the entire ecosystem lockstep. So all the seeds, all the clients all need to be upgraded to the 0 0.2x uh, set of releases. So some people in our ecosystem right now are on the 1 dot, like 1x, some are on the 2x. Um, hopefully, we'll be upgrading across the board soon, but for now, there just might be some uh, some of you that still have broken clients, at least with respect to the uh, the GIP repo. Uh, okay, so the next bit of housekeeping is on some GIPs that we've already talked about in the past. Uh, the first one is uh, GIP three. So we did a count. This one has already been voted on by the community in snapshot, but we hadn't yet done a protocol upgrade for this. So uh, the council voted on this in. G, uh, graph governance proposal uh, two uh, that passed uh, actually just this morning was the, the end of that vote. Um, and so we've initiated the first uh, transaction for that upgrade. These are two part upgrades. And so you should expect to see that this week. Just as a reminder to folks, that's just fixing a, uh, a, a minor bug for certain edge cases in the rewards contract. So it's not something that should uh, generally impact you. You shouldn't need to do any kind of upgrades on your software or on um, uh, any of your indexer strategies or anything like that. Uh, the next uh, one that we have that's in the pipes, this is to help support the scalar upgrade. Uh, this has been audited at this point. This is um, a withdrawal helper upgrade. And, and I'll let uh, actually Ariel uh, give him a little bit more color on this. Yeah, hello. Um, I'm going to show you, um, let me share my screen. I'm going to show you the uh, our repo with the latest um, improvements in the protocol. Um, the, the one that Brandon is mentioning is this one, a withdrawal helper. Uh, this is a contract we need to connect uh, the, um, the funds held in, this, in the different channels uh, to this taking contract, okay? So th this contract is already audited and um, what um, we will, will do is to deploy it to mainnet and uh, this will require a, a governance uh, vote to um, set this contract as a source of funds for the for the staking contract, uh, so we can uh, use it to send funds to the protocol. So th this is um, one of the uh, upcoming uh, governance uh, votes that we will like propose. Um, then there are uh, a couple of other uh, improvements that are related to bug fixes of edge cases. Um, this this one is uh, I think I I, I talked about this one uh, this one in the la uh, last town hall is audited. And uh, it's fixing a condition where um, uh, if you uh, use this function called stake two, um, you um, might skip set, uh, setting the delegation uh, parameters for your indexer. Um, so we fix that, that edge case. Um, again, if you, if you visit this um, PR, you'll see like the complete description of the, of the case of, of how it works and the solution of what, why is, um, like going to be proposed. And um, the other one is uh, some condition we detected uh, when closing um, allocations with POI in zero. Um, the update uh, snapshot that we need to calculate rewards was not properly called. Um, so uh, indexers uh, sending POIs with zero, um, um, with a zero uh, proof 
it's not very um, usual, but it might happen. And uh, in those cases, the, the, the rewards calculation is not properly done for, 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 the, for the time uh, it takes to send the next update. Uh, so that's another edge case with fix. It's already audited too. And um, the last um, improvement is um, this um, PR that is um, basically creating a cache of, con of addresses in each of the contracts. Um, so we spend less gas in transactions. Um, currently, the protocol works by having a registry of all the addresses of the different contracts. And going to look for each of these addresses is quite expensive. Uh, it requires a call uh, opcode. And this PR introduced like a local cache. So, so it's, we are S loading uh, the variable and um, that way we save uh, some gas. So um, this is another improvement that we, we are going to propose um or already audited too um and the last one that i want to mention is it's more of a feature um it's uh disputes um the, the dispute mechanism currently have a like um works by slashing indexers and uh, we currently have just one we, we had just one vari variable to to configure the slashing percentage uh so let's say if it's set to 10 percent whenever you present a bad proof you go to through the dispute process, and we like uh, the protocol will slash you by ten percent. The issue with that is that um, the same percentage is used for in for proof for indexing proof and query fee and queries and query attestations. So um, the the issue with this is that uh, an indexer will be responding to queries much more often than presenting proofs, and pro probably setting to the same percentage is too high. Uh, so um, we wanted to split these um, percentages to different uh, values. So uh, let's say um, a, bad proof, a bad indexing proof will be slashed by 2% and uh, a bad um, a query attestation will be slashed by 0.5%. Uh, so this PR um, allows to set different um, uh, percentages. Um, so that, that's most of the of the things. Th this PR is also already audited. Like everything I'm, I'm, I'm like, um talking now is is audited by uh by auditors so yeah i will share more information about the audits on 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 the forum yeah the meta update here is that we've gotten a lot better about booking auditors time in advance so we have uh i think starting in may we have one of our first retainers coming online and then another one coming online in june so we're hoping to have a much more steady stream of audits you know from this point forward for you know future updates to the protocol so the um the separate slashing percentages is kind of part of this uh, bigger effort to um, make arbitration disputes uh, more clear and consistent. So uh, we have a GIP that we're going to talk about in a little bit, but there's one more kind of dependency that uh, feeds into that, and that's um, deterministic uh, WASM-based uh, gas costing. And uh, Leo is going to, uh, from Edge of Node, is going to be talking a little bit about that. And I believe uh, that Zach already introduced the kind of the work in progress of this uh, in the last protocol town hall. So this is uh, Leo's picked up on that work and has kind of taken that over the finish line. Just for context, you can check out the recording from last time. Hello, uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, so this is, the, this is just a draft of the JP that I have uh, that I'm working on. It's not on Radical yet, um, so it might change a lot still. Um, but so, so gas costing, um, the reason it's necessary, what it does is it prevents, a hand, uh, it can prove that a handler has, is too expensive or has run for too long, uh, a handler for a trigger in a subgraph. And right now we only have timeouts, which they help because they prevent the handler from just like exhausting the, the indexer's resources on the machine that, that it's running. Um, but it's not deterministic. So that's a problem for protocol security because we need to be able to prove that the handler is too expensive. Um, so, and that the, the subgraph cannot make progress uh, past that block. 
So basically everything that a handler does needs to have a gas cost and everything to be needs to be a limit in this gas cost. And this is not unlike uh, the gas costing that you see in blockchain protocols, you know, and gas limits for blocks and such. Um, so one unit of our gas, uh, we, we, as a reference, we say that it's worth 0.1 nanoseconds of execution time. Um, this does not need to be like a straight correlation, but it, um, there needs to be some, some reference of execution time as the, so that it's actually measuring uh, execution costs to some extent. Um, so, and then the limit is one hour, uh, which equates then to 36 trillion gas. And this is, this is like larger than any indexer might actually want to run the handler for, and you can set a lower timeout. But if uh, the, you know, the fisherman or the arbitrator needs to actually prove that the handler is too expensive, then this is the, then we say that, okay, if you need it for, for one hour, it's reasonable to, to prove that the gas cost is over the limit. And then we get into the technicalities of how gas cost is measured. So, you know, a handler does two things. It's either executing WASM instructions or it is executing a host function that was called by WASM. Uh, so we have this um, technique to instrument the WASM blocks and injecting callbacks to measure the gas cost of the instructions. And you can see that the easiest way to see that is in the implementation itself, the cost for each instruction. And then there's a cost for each uh, host export, uh, such as uh, store guest or set, you know, call, and all of the other utilities that we have. And they're costed proportionally to their input. Um, so then we, yeah, so generally they're gonna have like a base cost and then they're gonna be like a, a cost per byte of input or output in some cases. Um, and then there's a guest size off trait which measures the, the size of each type that can be used as an input or output to host function. And then here are all of the constants and of the actual numbers for causing these gas, uh, these, these host experts or host functions. Um, so, for example, some interesting limits uh, the gas cost for Ethereum call is pretty high. This is because the, you know, we, we set a high gas limit for the in Ethereum gas that the call can take. Uh, so, so, this uh, sets a maximum of, of 1,400 contra calls per handler. Which should be enough for any reasonable subgraph. Um, start set, the limit is um, you know, 250,000 entities or one gigabyte of data. Uh, start get, you know, 10 gigabytes of data or 10 million entities. So we, we don't expect any subgraph that exists today to ever hit this limit. It's just to prevent abuse, really. And then there's the details for how the the gas cost is calculated for each of the operations. So, you know, there's like all of the math operations, big ins, big decimal. So for example, one, of the, one that's particularly expensive is, you know, big in uh, power, which is like the exponentiation function. And that has an, has an exponential complex, uh, computational complexity. So this, you know, if you use an exponent that's large, you could actually reasonably go over the gas cost. Uh, so that has like a more, practical implication here. Uh, but yes, I think that's what I had on gas cost. Oh yeah, thanks. Um, and like, yeah, like Leo said, you know, an important clarification here is like the goal right now isn't for it to be super, super precise. The main goal for this wave of this is to kind of achieve determinism. Obviously, you know, uh, Leo looked carefully at like the time complexity of these things and tried to get it, you know, right on the rough order of magnitude, but we can refine these, um, you know, constants over time. Uh, we can also do more, you know, uh, with, you know, the gas cost, right? So right now it's just going to be a protocol based, uh, you know, sort of default limit, but you could even have this like be exposed in like a subgraph manifest, for example, as like a hint to indexers that, hey, this, you know, this subgraph is like relatively easy to index compared to, you know, this other, uh, this other subgraph. So this is kind of foundational, but there's a lot of, I think work and and uh, proposals that could come out of this, you know, in the future. Uh, do you mind if I share my screen, Leo? 
yeah can you force me to stop sharing it i can actually do it myself oh Thanks. all right martin's got you cool so we got one more gip uh this is another one that's work in progress should be published uh hopefully today or tomorrow um related to determinism uh this is another one from me and i'll walk you through it very quickly so this is a process gip this is not a um uh, this is not a like protocol upgrade. Um, so this is a process that the graph council and the community and the graph core developers would need to kind of follow in order for this to work. Um, and the goal of this process is to establish what is the canonical behavior of the subgraph API and the protocol at any given time. And how do the features of that subgraph API uh, interact with the features of the protocol? So there's there's two kind of motivations behind this. Um, one of them I already kind of hinted at, which is that you know we want to be able to support things like arbitration in the protocol to secure uh, and provide like good guarantees for the integrity of query results and indexing, and that requires determinism. So that's why you saw you know Leo give this presentation around the Wasm gas costing. Um, but we also need to have everyone in the network sort of agree what is the correct version of the behavior. You know, for actually implementing the uh, the subgraph API, um, so that's kind of the first goal here. The second goal uh, is a little bit more subtle, but uh, as you all know, you know, Edge and Node as an operator of a centralized indexer today, uh, the the quote unquote hosted service, you know, is is adding support for you know uh, chains at a very rapid rate. Um, the graph. Uh, node core team are also adding uh, new features at a very rapid rate. Effectively, you know, the graph is a protocol that's still under rapid development. Um, and not every feature right out the gates is going to be compatible with the full range of protocol features in the decentralized network. Um, and so part of what this process is also trying to establish is you can kind of think of it as a life cycle or stages for features to be added to the decentralized network immediately, but then have gradual support or you know granular support added over time. And what that lets us do is in, instead of having to send traffic through the hosted service or to some other you know centralized indexer, it allows us to divert all traffic through to the decentralized network. adds clarity to uh, consumers and indexers that are using those subgraphs in the decentralized network, what protocol features that subgraph is going to be interacting with. Um, so that might be a little bit um, abstract. I'm actually just going to scroll down and jump to the example I included here. Uh, and actually, we're looking at Markdown. So, uh, so this is uh, this is meant to be illustrative. This isn't the this isn't meant to be the exact matrix. But the idea is that on this left column here, we have uh, features of the subgraph API, right? So we have things like full text search. Um, we have things like uh, Ethereum mappings that can call out to IPFS. Uh, we have things, you know, like some of the multi blockchain ones that are uh, being su uh, supported, uh, Ethereum test nets, uh, and so on. Um, and not all of these are going to have the same levels of. Uh, uh, determinism, right? So full text search, for example, right today is at the stage of development that it's at and, and research, it is deterministic with respect to indexing, but it is not deterministic with respect to querying. And so I think this, this is something that we saw created a lot of confusion uh, a week or two ago when we did the first round of migrations um, to the decentralized network, the Omen subgraph got published and the Omen subgraph has full text search. And so a lot of indexers were kind of scrambling, like, well, do we index this? Do we not index this? What is, what is the nature of interacting with the subgraph? What does that mean to us for our participation in the network? Consumers would have the same questions. So the goal is to establish a matrix like this that would say, okay, this you know, subgraph omen, it uses full text search. Okay, that means, yes, in fact, it is eligible for indexing awards. Yes, it is eligible for uh, proof of indexing disputes, arbitration and slashing. However, because the queries that involve full text search are not deterministic uh, yet, it would not be eligible for um, slashing of 
uh, query bit slashing based on query disputes uh, using uh, query attestations. Um, and the matrix, the matrix is actually more complex than you would expect. There are some features which are sort of trivially deterministic with respect to indexing, but uh, not querying. Some that are deterministic with respect to querying, not um, not indexing. Um, and then there's some uh, I don't have it in my list here, but there's also some features that are just simply experimental, right? Where you don't want to um, commit to an API too early because developers are gonna take a really big dependency on that. And so you might still wanna have the freedom to make breaking changes as you know the, the graph node core team and uh, contributors you know, collect feedback on that API. And that's another great example of where you wouldn't necessarily want to enable uh let's say it's a query you know api you wouldn't want to enable query arbitration and slashing right away because there's you know a non-determinism just built into the versioning of that of that feature um so let me get into concretely just what this could look like in the network uh so to pop back over to the gip um so at a high level this is kind of the important things to to kind of keep in mind for the process so uh this is all kind of elaborated in prose, but I'm, I'm just going to kind of walk you through the bullets. Uh, so th the main thing here is that given that the graph node or and given that the protocol itself is still just, you know, relatively new as far as protocols go, you know, launched back in December, still, you know, features being added all the time under super rapid development. It's pretty hard right now to get a stable, like client independent technical specification of the complete subgraph API. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's sort of this like waterfall versus agile trade off, you know, that you see a lot of companies in the traditional, uh, you know, software space making. So for right now, uh, the proposal here is that graph node be used as the reference implementation for the subgraph API. Um, and what that means is that for a given version of graph node, uh, any behavior that it implements for the subgraph API is sort of by definition, the um, the canonical behavior. And so that, that even includes like, if there's, you know, some buggy, uh, you know, something that you might consider buggy for the purposes of proofs of indexing and slashing and attestations and disputes, that would be the canonical behavior. Um, the other proposal here is that the graph node be the source of truth for feature detection. So I, I just showed this, you know, matrix over here and you know, I think the first thing people would be wondering is like, well, how do I figure out what features a subgraph is using? So the proposal is that um, starting in a future version of graph node, uh, graph node enforces that when it runs a subgraph and it does feature detection on a subgraph, that the features detected uh, while running the subgraph match the features that are listed in the subgraph manifest itself. So there's going to be like one or either a, a features key for probably just one features key of features that are included in that um, uh, in that subgraph. Some of them might be marked as experimental. Um, and this isn't something that needs to impose a new uh, operational overhead on DAP developers or subgraph developers because this is logic that can be built into the to the graph CLI. So this already happens today when you actually like the subgraph manifest that most people have in like their GitHub repos isn't identical to what actually gets published to the network because the graph CLI builds that subgraph and publishes the subgraph manifest to uh, the built subgraph manifest to IPFS. So the graph CLI can do the exact same feature detection as uh, that the graph node will do and it can augment the subgraph manifest with the, the correct listed features. And what that, what that does is it gives us, you know, a source of truth um, that most people can look at without actually having to run a graph node themselves that they can be reasonably sure represents, you know, the features that are used for that subgraph. So that includes consumers, that includes indexers that just want to search for subgraphs without actually like loading each one into graph node first to run feature detection. Um, and then having that accurate list of features gives you the names that you could then again reference this matrix and see okay what features in the network you know is this going to be supported for uh next stage of uh the process is basically to have the graph council be the source of truth for both uh 
the feature support matrix, as well as the canonical graph node version. Um, so the idea here is that uh, the graph council, you know, today already has been voting on G, uh, GGPs. You know, we just went through, uh, you know, if you guys haven't checked these out already in a snapshot, you know, check out snapshot. The graph council has been voting on uh, graph governance proposals specifically for protocol upgrades. You know, the graph council could also vote on a proposal that doesn't actually result in any on-chain transactions, but simply establishes the new canonical graph node version, as well as the new canonical support matrix of features in the um, in the protocol. And this becomes really important for the arbitrator, you know, to have a reference for, uh, which we'll get into in the next GIP, but that's part of the uh, uh, part of the rationale for, for adding clarity and defining this process now. Um, the next step of the process is a recommendation for the graph node core developers, uh, which is to version graph node using Sember standards, um, specifically the convention that between um, major versions of graph node, no breaking changes should be added, although new features can be accreted. And so this means that between major versions, so let's say hypothetically, uh, the graph council votes on a graph governance proposal for graph node version 1.0 and they say okay 1.0 is the canonical version of the uh you know of the subgraph api behavior indexers should be free to upgrade to any 1.x uh, version of graph node without fear of uh being slashed due to inconsistent query attestations or inconsistent um, uh, inconsistent like uh, proofs of indexing. Um, this is actually still quite a flexible strategy because the, uh, as many of you know, the um, uh, subgraph manifest itself can be version bumped. So there's a spec on the subgraph manifest. And so that also gives you like another outlet for sort of uh, adding new functionality or even changing functionality while keeping the graph node backwards compatible for existing subgraphs uh, in the network. Um, so that's kind of the convention there. And we'll get into this as well. But you know, if for some reason, like a bug is, uh, uh, is written that does introduce a backwards and compatible change, you know, inadvertently, um, the arbitrator does have discretion to, to sort of reverse engineer and do, uh, and do some sort of uh, root cause analysis on like, why uh, you know, the POI was inconsistent or the attestation was inconsistent. And so we'll talk about that more in the next uh, uh, GIP, but this is sort of the foundational part of that. Um, and then the last uh, part of this process is optional, but I think it's one that's probably practical for the short term, which is that the graph council can, um, can also ratify N minus one support windows for past graph node versions. Uh, and so, very likely any time that the, that the council would uh, vote on a new canonical version of graph node and the subgraph API, it would likely not be uh, immediately effective. It would probably be effective as, some as of some future block or some future epoch in the protocol. Nonetheless, having a knife edge rollout of graph node, especially this early in the protocol when you know, some subgraphs, you know, take days or even weeks to sync. Um, it could be really disruptive to the protocol. And, you know, we're not trying to do anything that creates downtime for users or consumers of the protocol unnecessarily at this stage, especially as we're, you know, underway with the, the subgraph migration, you know, of uh, new projects rolling out their, their subgraphs into, into production. Um, Eva, just a quick process check. Am I, am I good for the rest of the agenda on this call? Or is there time we need to, to leave at the end? Just leaving time for Q&A. Q&A, great. All right, I'll try and speed through this. But um, uh, so yeah, so that's, so that the council could basically say, you know, just to wrap that point up that, you know, for some window of time, both the current version and the past version of graph node could be considered uh, the correct behavior. And so that kind of, um, gives indexers a little bit more flexibility in upgrading while making sure that they can continue submitting proofs of indexing, collecting indexing rewards, and accepting queries and query fees. Um, and so that's kind of the, the gist of this proposal. 
Um, so the next one uh, that we want to check out is the arbitration charter. And so this has been published already in the forums. I know some of you were having trouble accessing this, uh, but I've also posted it as a HackMD. Uh, I know uh, Zorro, uh, I guess Oliver, I should say, uh, has provided some feedback uh, on this. But yeah, I encourage the rest of you to check it out. Um, so the goal of the arbitration charter is to add clarity to the behavior of uh, the arbitrator beyond that which is um, uh, specified in the smart contract code itself, right? So this is actually a what we call a protocol charter. This was described in GIP uh, 001. Um, and the idea is that you know, the graph council could ratify this protocol charter and this actually is intended to bind the behavior of the arbitrator, meaning that if the arbitrator is found to not be in compliance with the arbitration charter, the graph council is making an implicit commitment to uh, reassign or remove that arbitrator. You know, so that's the um, that's what the graph council ratifying this would represent should they choose to do so. Um, so just a quick recap for, for anyone on the call. I think this is, I think everyone's probably familiar with this at this point, but the arbitrator's role is to decide the outcomes of disputes. There's two main types of disputes, proofs of indexing disputes and query attestation disputes. Um, and generally we call the people that submit disputes, uh, fishermen or fisher people, I guess. Um, and there's a number of different kind of paths for, for detecting those errors and submitting those disputes, which we don't need to uh, get too deep into today. Um, so I'm just going to jump into the, the body of the charter. Uh, each of these sections has kind of its own rationale that I'll, I'll try and walk through. I know it's a lot of text, but hopefully I can, uh, can paint a good narrative here. Um, the second point is basically just what I described that uh, you know, the council can remove the arbitrator if they're not complying with the body of the charter. Um, this is basically just some review of the types of outcomes that are possible for these different types of disputes. One sort of detail is that there's actually a, two types of query disputes. So you, there's one type of dispute where the fisherman disputes a, a query directly themselves. And another is where a fisherman detects two query attestations by two separate indexers that conflict with one another. And then they submit both of them as a as a dispute. Um, the main thing to pay attention to here is that one of the accepted outcomes is a draw. Um, and so, even though from a technical standpoint, in most cases there is going to be a correct answer to the, the query or the or the proof of indexing, uh, in the early days of the network, the arbitrator has the ability to settle a dispute as a draw, and the rest of the ar this arbitration charter outlines a couple ways in which that power could be used. Um, the first one I already alluded to this in the last GIP is around determinism bugs. So these have happened, you know, so the Edge and Node team's been running a graph node in production at this point for several years. Um, we've had our share of determinism bugs over the years. Sometimes they're hard to pin down. Um, I fully expect that as the protocol, as the goal of the protocol is to continue adding value for users and adding features on a quick cadence, there is the possibility that determinism bugs might be introduced again in the future. So in the cases where the arbitrator can make a reasonable um, uh, assessment that a proof of indexing or at query attestation was likely incorrect due to a software malfunction, a software error, some kind of determinism bug, they have the a discretion to settle a dispute as a, uh, as a draw. Um, one thing I'm going to jump around a little bit here just because we're, we're talking about these determinism bugs, but one thing related to that is uh, the GIP that Ar uh, Ariel presented earlier about the separate, um, uh, you know, slashing percentages for queries and indexing. Like you said, part of that is the fact that like over the sing a single allocation or a single, you know, set of epochs, a indexer is likely to only submit a single proof of indexing but they could submit millions of queries, right? And each of those queries in theory is a chance to hit one of these determinism bugs uh, and a chance to be you know, slashed or disputed. So 
Ariel's GIP laid the foundation of um, establishing separate slashing percentages for these proofs of indexing and proof of, and, and query attestations to not make the burden of serving queries too high. Another thing that we do is we set a maximum uh, allowable slashing for query disputes uh, over a given allocation. And the maximum that's proposed in this arbitration charter is that an indexer can only be slashed for queries uh, once per epoch per allocation. Um, so, uh, so if you have an allocation that's uh, uh, you know spans 28 epochs, you could in theory be slashed 28 times. And again, we're you know we want to parameterize that slashing percentage so that um, even with the arbitrator exercising discretion, um, there's very little chance of like an indexer getting wiped out or significantly um, you know harmed uh, due to like a determinism bug or something to that effect. Um, that's kind of the goal at this point is to sort of protect indexers while the protocol is under rapid development and the network is bootstrapping. Um, another thing we've put into kind of add fairness um, and protect indexers is put in double jeopardy. So right now the query attestation structure um, doesn't have any uh, uh, it doesn't have any form of replay pr protection. So the same query, uh, the same query body and query result will produce the same attestation structure every single time, which means that the protocol can't yet distinguish between, um, you know, the the indexer making the same error, you know, ten times versus someone just submitting a single error, you know, ten times. Uh, I'll, I'll note that for a number of things in this charter, these are things that we may want to write um, proposals to change in other parts of the protocol in the future. Um, in the case of the attestation structure, this is split across almost every code base in, in the system, which is you know uh, substantial. Um, and so uh, the lower risk option right now is to to implement the double jeopardy rule, and then you know we can work on a uh, you know, a proposal at our leisure when we can schedule this sort of lockstep upgrade of the uh, the attestation structure across a lot of our, our code bases. Brandon, just as a time check, we've got seven minutes. Great, yeah, so let me speed through this. Uh, next one is statute of limitations. I think that's pretty straightforward just from the legal analog. The goal here is not to disadvantage indexers with respect to attackers, right? So attackers can unstake immediately after doing an attack, but honest indexers will stay online and keep working. And so it doesn't make any sense for indexers to be on the hook for errors that they committed, you know, past a certain amount of time in the past when attackers won't be uh, afforded that risk. Um, data availability just describes the fact that the arbitrator can't settle any dispute where the data to settle the dispute is unavailable. I think that's pretty uh, clear. In general, the Fisher people should have uh, the incentive to make sure that data stays available so that they can get their fisherman reward. But in the meantime, the arbitrator will settle those as a draw. Uh, we talked about this one about the max maximizing the uh, or setting the cap on the amount of slashing. Uh, valid proofs of indexing for a given epoch. This is basically relates to the GIP we just went through. Um, so that's that's kind of the dependency for this. Uh, uh, for this section, but it additionally specifies that when an indexer is submitting a proof of indexing, the correct proof of indexing is the one for the first epoch of the, um, uh, excuse me, the first block of the epoch in which the allocation is closed, with the caveat that because it's unpredictable when a transaction is going to get mined, if an indexer submits a proof of indexing for the first block of the previous epoch, that would all that would be settled as a draw. It wouldn't. It would be forgiven, even though it's not technically uh, correct. Um, the arbitrator is on the hook for settling disputes in a timely manner, and the rest of this GIP is basically the motivation and rationale that uh, I kind of walked you through as we were walking through the the sections. So we've already gotten some good feedback on this in the forums. This will probably likely go through some updates before it's you know considered in a more complete state. I encourage you to take a look at this. Um, the next steps for this GIP would, for the, would be for the Graph Council to discuss it and uh, ratify it using a uh, 
uh, a GGP once once they feel that the community is at a uh, you know a reasonable level of like consensus and understanding on on the proposal. So I'll stop there. I know we've covered a lot, but we've got about five minutes or so for for questions or comments. We've got a question here from Sam Green. Uh, what is the expected turnaround time for arbitration? So what the, I believe what the charter says is that they should uh, attempt to settle it within a thawing period. The idea being that if it is an attacker, they would you know, uh, presumably unstake right after their attack. And you know, we wanna make sure that all disputes are settled within a, a thawing period. Um, that's, it, it, that's aspirational for the arbitrator. It's not always gonna be possible, even if the arbitrator is trying their best, just depending on uh, the subgraph and, you know, uh, the type of attack, but that's the that's the goal that the arbitrator should be held to. We have another question. When will the slashing be allowed? Only after this GIP? <laughs> so technically slashing has always been allowed. Uh, it's the, I think the communication early on, uh, maybe even before the protocol was launched, that was that the arbitrator would exercise discretion in doing that. And uh, and that was never defined what discretion meant. This charter is meant to add a little bit more clarity to that. Um, but slashing has been enabled in the protocol from from day one. And I think the arbitrator, if it were to see you know past malicious activity within the statute of limitations uh, defined in this charter, I think they would have a um, mandate to to slash. I have one question. Uh, you know, so you you talked a lot about some of the upcoming changes. We also have migration going on. Um, in your opinion, what do you think indexers can do right now to get best prepared for what's coming? Great, great question. Well, we have a migration workshop tomorrow where we're going to be focusing the whole workshop on disputes and arbitration. Um, so we'll be going through some of the. We'll be reviewing some of what we discussed in this uh, town hall today with respect to the charters but we'll actually be going a lot deeper into the tooling. So Ford uh, has been working a lot on the indexer agent and specifically a feature we call POI cross-checking. So this is the way that honest indexers in the protocol can automatically detect bad POIs from other indexers and it flags them for manual review. Um, and Ariel has been working on a CLI tool for um, taking that data that's output by the manual review and submitting a dispute uh, on chain. And so tomorrow we'll be going through that uh, in depth. And yeah, I hope to see you all there. Awesome. Are there any final questions? No, it looks like we're good. So thank you everyone for joining us again. Oh, we have one one final question. Uh, Semi-unrelated, does the graph have web sockets? Uh, so the, I'm not sure what part of the system you're referring to. The graph does, uh, or a version of the graph node supported subscriptions. I believe it's been deprecated and not used web sockets. Uh, I'm not sure what other parts of the system uh, might use web sockets. The state channels use NATs. Yeah, so for subscriptions, yeah. Yeah, so the subscriptions uh, used used web sockets. They're generally not recommended for for usage. Um, a, they're not yet supported in the decentralized uh, protocol, so we encourage people to use polling for now as a strategy. Uh, and they're stateful, so they, you know, if you were to try and use them in the decentralized network, it requires you to have an ongoing relationship with a single indexer, which you know we're kind of trying to encourage more of a many-to-many real-time marketplace between consumers and indexers. And we've got a follow-on question for front-end web development. Is there a way to add event-based, uh, I'm assuming subscriptions or querying? Yeah, I'm not totally clear on the question, but you are able to define subgraphs, if, if I understand the question correctly, where the entities correspond to events. Um, we've done this for some of our like analytics use cases internally, uh, and you could pull for those events. So you could have a subgraph that you pull uh, just to get uh, real-time events. 
Uh, so yeah, another question here is, will non-technical users be able to be fishermen? So for the indexing proofs of indexing, uh, excuse me, the indexing disputes, unlikely in the sense that it's indexers checking the work of other indexers. For the query disputes, uh, the goal is for users to be uh, fishermen. And the way that that would work is um, either using the gateway, which is what most end users will use today, or using a query engine running on their local machine. The query engine, based on the user's parameters, can periodically cross-check results against multiple indexers. And if it ever spots um, inconsistent results from two indexers for the exact same query, you know that at least one of those indexers is slashable, right? Because that those results should agree with one another. And then there will be a UI for uh, end users to submit disputes in that case uh, to, to, slash, uh, uh, to slash indexers. And so, yeah, that, that's something that a non-technical user could do. Awesome, so we're just about time. Thank you everyone for joining us for the third Protocol Town Hall and we'll see you on the forum in the Discord and next month. Thanks a lot everyone.